Hi, I'm Brad Power, and this is the Cancer Patient Lab and Prostate Cancer Lab, and we're pleased to have with us Andy Armstrong today. This is round two. Um, he previously had a session with us where he went through some of his research and talked about some and answered some questions, and uh, we didn't get through everything, and he has more research, more ideas to share with us, and uh, more time. He's generously offered more time to have uh, a further answer further questions. Um, as usual, uh, let me just say the dis disclaimer is up front here. Uh, this is not medical advice. This is for information purposes only. This should uh, give you ideas that you may be able to take to your medical team. Um, and secondly, everything you say will be made public. So if you're concerned about identifying yourself or um, anything that you say being identified, please um, Disguise yourself and don't say anything because everything will be made public. And with that, I'll turn it over to Andy. Again, thank you, Andy, for taking your time and generously spending it with us. Thank you, Brad. I'm going to share my screen and see how this works. Swap it. How's that? We can see it. Great. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, the last time I talked much more about precision biomarkers. Um, artificial intelligence pathology, liquid biopsies, and how that can guide treatment. And but as a medical oncologist, I'm much more, you know, invested in new treatments. So uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, clinical trials. And so I thought I'd spend a little bit of time just talking about, um, you know, how we think about prostate cancer right now in 2023 and some of the trials that are available at Duke and, and how we're thinking of sequencing various therapies as men go through their journey. And um, we'll just start with like the big highlights. So, you know, I think for this coming year, you know, digital pathology is a big highlight. I talked about that last time, but more impactful to patients who are trying to fight advanced or stage four prostate cancer is, is the earlier use of potent AR inhibitors. Some men are actually experiencing more cures because of that, so they never experience metastatic disease. Um, the integration of multidisciplinary care with radiation and metastasis-directed therapy from some of these other trials. Uh, we're seeing these AR inhibitors move earlier and earlier. Um, we presented at ASCO uh, this past summer on you know, some disparities biology and some interesting um, findings in black men who are dealing with aggressive prostate cancer and, and black men, as you know, are quite um, disproportionately affected by lethal disease. So, you know, here at Duke, we see about a quarter of our patients uh, are of African ancestry and, and we've developed some trials um, where we found some pretty amazing outcomes that are unique to black men or men of African ancestry. Uh, I don't have time to cover everything. You know, there's a lot of interesting research that we're doing. Uh, we can talk about PARP AR combinations in 2023. We actually have three drug approvals from that. So you, you guys might be interested in hearing about that. And so, um, so I put together this little timeline for you just to see the long history of prostate cancer since the, the first Nobel Prize winning lecture in 1941. Uh, for the discovery of orchiectomy all the way to 2023 and maybe next month with the PSMA4 study uh, where we've gone through um, hormonal therapies, androgen deprivation therapies, docetaxel, other taxanes, various uh, negative studies not shown here, but these are largely the positive studies and those acronyms that translated into positive life prolonging studies. Uh, both for castration resistance and hormone sensitive prostate cancer. So, you know, given the limited time, I'm not going to show this, but I'm also happy to provide slides so you, people can have this as a benchmark as we grow this going in, into the next year. Um, the the biggest impact, as you can see in the on this far side, has been you know, these newer combination studies. Um, the movement of AR inhibitors into earlier and earlier settings as as men are living longer now with even with advanced disease. Um, it's a journey for every patient and every patient is different and uh, their biology is different and their outcomes and responses differ. And, and some of that differences are based on, you know, the patient and some are based on the tumor. Um, for some men who start their journey with localized disease, we have remissions and relapses for those men who are not cured. 
with a range of treatment options that are kind of shown here, according to, our, to a, a standard algorithm of using these AR inhibitors early, um, Cipula cell T, radium, taxanes, and then precision medicines such as Pluvicto or certain uh, PARP inhibitors or pembrolizumab in very certain circumstances. Um, however, there, there's a group of patients that kind of skip over this. They present with metastatic disease. In the U.S., that's about 10%. You know, with COVID, uh, that's probably gone up a bit as men have often not gone to their doctors to get appropriate screening. And so we worry about an uptick in the presentation with metastatic disease. I, I just got back from India about two weeks ago and there the prevalence is 70%. So 70% of all men with prostate cancer in many um, emerging uh, economies uh, where there's no screening in place, uh, most men with prostate cancer have metastatic disease. And that's just an unfortunate reality of what happens when you don't screen and have an early detection program. So uh, the journey for these men who start with metastatic disease is often a bit shorter, but we still have the same um, available standards of care in terms of systemic therapies. Uh, these are just some examples of some of the major phase three studies. I was honored to lead one of these studies called the ARCHES study that led to the approval of enzalutamide or Xtandi in the hormone sensitive setting, but there, there's equal similar survival benefits with abiraterone and androgen synthesis inhibitor. And then APA and ENZA are our two you know, main AR blockers that have similarly extended life and delayed progression in this earlier setting. Uh, I put a little table together of all the life prolonging studies in men with metastatic hormone sensitive, which means they're not yet resistant to hormonal therapy. And that includes radiation, all these hormonal therapies, as well as now triplet therapy, where some men are getting uh, combination approaches. Um, we just published, uh, along with a fellow at Duke, uh, a nice algorithm that's referenced here. And again, I can share this with Brad. And uh, as you're counseling patients who are just starting their journey, this journey is uh, the, the, the guidelines and evidence supporting what to start with first has really radically changed in the last few years. It's no longer standard of care to offer Lupron, for example, alone or ADT alone but rather treatment intensification is the standard of care. And that treatment intensification often involves a potent AR blocker, sometimes triple therapy for patients with um, a large amount of prostate cancer that's metastatic, uh, treatment of the, the primary, the prostate itself for men who have a, a lower amount of cancer outside the prostate. And so the algorithm really branches depending on how much of a burden the cancer is and whether it started with metastatic disease or developed metastatic disease later, which we call metachronous. Um, we also just published about a month ago that even with just a single metastasis, there's an improvement in survival with systemic therapy because metastatic prostate cancer is often a systemic disease and treating it as such improves outcomes rather than necessarily treating a single spot like it's um, uh, a solid, truly a solitary spot. We know that radiation to the primary improves survival um, and that sometimes radiating these metastatic spots can improve outcomes. This is data from STOMP, which was published a few years ago now, uh, where unfortunately most patients do not uh, benefit from metastasis-directed radiotherapy. But some do, you know, about a third really have a prolonged period of time where they get to avoid hormonal therapy. So these men are very happy and these men relapsed, suggesting that most patients, it is a systemic disease where they should be treated as such. But in some men, they can um, have a successful delay in systemic therapy. This was also seen in the Oriole study named after the Baltimore Oriole from Hopkins, uh, where radiation or SABR, stereotactic Body radiation was able to delay hormones in some men, but still most men uh, relapsed over this short period of time. But if you treated all the lesions on PSMA PET, you got better outcomes, but still almost half the patients are relapsing uh, at about two years. Um, what about in combination? Using hormones and radiation to these spots together does suggest a better approach than just Lupron alone, but as, as I think I showed you in this um, this study, 
you know, you'd rather be on this curve way up here at the top than on this curve. And this is the data with enzalutamide, you know, and Lupron. And if you look at uh, <clears throat> Lupron alone in the EXTEND study, even with radiation, you're way down here. So I think the field is in generally in general moving towards a combined approach of best systemic therapy, whether that's Lupron or drugs like it, potent AR blockade, and perhaps radiating the primary so that eventually we might be able to stop these therapies and, and allow patients to enjoy remission without all these hormonal uh, therapies. So I just highlight survivorship because these men are living a lot longer. Um, Patients like you um, are enjoying remissions, but they're suffering from the side effects of these treatments. And so there's a lot of movement towards emphasizing the whole patient, mental health, cardiovascular health, reducing obesity, eating healthy diets, vaccinations to prevent other infectious diseases, um, and long-term attention of bone and heart. Um, when we talk about, well, what do you do next after your disease has become resistant to an AR inhibitor, the unfortunate reality is that most men in the U.S. Um, are not getting many therapies. They're, they're definitely getting first-line therapy, but there's a steep drop-off where less than half the patients even make it and get second-line and another half drop-off before third-line. And the reasons are because uh, a progression event is often very morbid. It can cause a lot of, you know, uh, problems for the patient uh, who may already de be dealing with a lot of other health problems. So it's really important to hit the cancer up front with your best weapon and, and see if, you know, obviously that can prolong survival and delay progression the longest. These are all, this is a table of all of the life prolonging therapies. Obviously in this short amount of time, I can't cover all of them. This would literally take many hours and hopefully your group is uh, going through some of these, these are the conventional FDA approved therapies. They're all life prolonging, all with hazard ratios uh, in, uh, below one. But you can see that we still have a long way to go. The average survival improvement for all of our approved therapies is generally four to five months or less. So that's not great. You know, that's a median. Obviously, that's a, you know, there's generally a, a bell curve distribution of these improvements. Some men get extra years of life. Some men don't respond at all. And this ranges from docetaxel to our potent AR inhibitors to some newer precision therapies like Pluvicto um, and PARP inhibitors. Um, like I talked about last lecture, DNA uh, testing, either your tumor or a liquid biopsy is very helpful to help guide these therapies that you wouldn't otherwise know about. Most men in the community are not getting any testing, especially in urology practices. And so I think, you know, one message that we try to convey in um, discussions with patients and patient advocate societies is really ask your doctor about getting tested, both germline and tumor testing, uh, where that, that can only help you. You know, it can help save the lives of your daughters or sons who might have a BRCA syndrome or BRCA mutation where cancer can be intercepted in the next generation, but it might help the patient directly open the door for a PARP inhibitor or a PD-1 inhibitor that may extend or improve their survival. Um, there's lots of different ways to do the testing, solid and liquid. I covered this last time. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna whiz right through all this. <clears throat> um, part of my research is trying to improve the liquid biopsy. There's a lot of things that for commercial assays are missing in the way we do our testing. And I'm one of those types of docs that was mentioned earlier on this call that I see patients, but I also run a lab. And a lot of what I do in the lab is try to develop precision medicine tests and understand the cancer's biology so that we can bring um, new treatments into the clinic. Um, so there's a lot of work being done on um, circulating DNA, circulating RNA, circulating epigenetics to understand cancer biology, how it evolves, it adapts, and develops um, resistance to our therapy. So we can not just objectively measure that, but ideally target some of those features to improve patient outcomes. I'm going to skip through some of this. So Brad, ha have you guys had a talk on the PARP inhibitor combos? And if so, I can skip through this. You know, this was the biggest breakthrough of this year for these FDA approvals in 2023. So I could spend five minutes on it. Uh, please do. I don't believe we have. 
Okay, I'll be brief. Um, so the idea behind um, this whole concept is that in prostate cancer, DNA repair is really important. You know, the lack of DNA repair is what causes cancer, mutagenesis, mutations. In our normal cells, we have these enzymes, they're proofreaders, they correct DNA mutations that occur during cell division, but cancer uh, often has faulty DNA repair and the mutations pile up. And some of that's caused by just breathing oxygen and having free radicals, but some of this is because of inherited mutations in DNA repair enzymes, like a, a patient with a BRCA2 mutation. And so DNA damage can get repaired. And, and one novel finding is that the androgen receptor inside prostate cancers actually regulates DNA repair. And another enzyme called PARP, think of that as like a backup proofreader. So you've got genes like BRCA1 and BRCA2 that are your primary proofreaders, and then PARP is a backup pr proofreader. So the idea behind combining AR and PARP inhibitors is that um, you can block the proofreaders inside the cancer cell directly so that the cancer basically falls apart from overwhelming errors. So um, the cancer really needs to protect itself from all those errors so that it survives. But if you push the cancer over the cliff with a huge number of mutations, the cancer cell can die. And so that's where alaparib or linparza or talazoparib and um, AR blockade comes in. You're, you're enhancing DNA repair um, breaks. Uh, you're blocking DNA repair enzymes and that's leading to more anti-cancer efficacy. So I hope that little biologic primer helps. And there is some data to support this from early on where we conducted a trial with abiraterone and a PARP inhibitor that delayed uh, uh, progression or death in unselected patients, even in patients that did not have inherited mutations. This led to the PROPEL study, which has now been published twice and just a um, couple months ago led to an FDA approval. So it's important to, to look at the patients in this study. This is a global big study, um, you know, over a thousand, almost a thousand patients, you know, 800 patients. These are all metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer patients. They had, you know, good functional status. Um, they had not had a prior novel hormonal therapy, but they could have had prior chemo. And they either got the standard of care, which is Abby, which many of you are familiar with, or Abby plus a lap rib. So everybody got the standard of care. And the experiment was to see if the PARP inhibitor could improve outcomes. And it did. In an all-comer patient population, fewer men experienced progression. This is a significant result. This is about an eight-month delay by the investigator assessments. And then by a blinded radiologic review, it was about an 11-month delay. So that is uh, substantial. The European Union looked at this data and approved it for all comers. And this is the primary endpoint. The FDA, however, you know, uh, did not look at it in the exact same way. They looked at the all comers, but they saw that the patients who are deriving the greatest benefit were those that had a BRCA mutation. You see, you know, the hazard ratio here is 0.2. That's a phenomenal impact on patients with BRCA mutations. But patients without BRCA mutations still benefited. Um, but this is the group that the FDA approved this combination in. Um, another reason for that is the overall survival, while it technically was numerically greater, did not yet meet the statistical significance that was pre-specified. It was very close, 0.05 versus 0.0377. Uh, numerically, it was about seven-month improvement. But if you look at the BRCA carriers, this is survival, not progression-free survival. That's a huge difference in overall survival. So again, this is what the FDA approved the combination for, is if you have a BRCA mutation either inherited or in your tumor, uh, half of patients are either way, there's a massive improvement in survival. Um, so this, this is now a standard of care for these patients. But if you don't have a BRCA mutation, while there's a delay in progression, the survival benefits are not very clear. You know, and this data is pretty immature. There's only a one or two month improvement in survival. So that's why this combination is not as exciting, you know, as in BRCA carriers. So there's a, a minor impact on survival. There's a more major impact on delaying progression, which is important, but um, there are risks for this combination. 
And, uh, you know, those risks are things like anemia. So about one out of six patients will require a blood transfusion because of the PARP inhibitor. Most of these patients do experience, you know, some fatigue. You can see with abiraterone, there's side effects as well. Um, there's no treatment combinations that have generally fewer side effects. So um, more, more pills, more costs. So each patient obviously should weigh the risks and benefits of this approach, the advantage of delaying progression versus these side effects and added costs. It's not for everybody. Um, certainly patients who are more frail, who um, you know, don't have a BRCA mutation are gonna have much less benefit. These are the, the FDA labels now and the European labels different, a little more broad. Um, there's another combination, you know, that just got approved a few weeks ago. It's called Talazoparib, based on the Talazoparib Talapro phase two, uh, three trial. Another PARP inhibitor, this time in combination with Extandi or Enza, similar design to Propel, where the control group got enzalutamide. And the goal was to delay progression and ultimately hope that that led to improved survival. And just like Propel, the study was positive for all comers significant delay in progression somewhere by, you know, eight to 10 months again. Um, the FDA approved this uh, for patients with what's called DNA repair defects or homologous repair deficiency, where there is a greater benefit in delaying progression, has ratio 0.48. They did not approve it for a broad population. And the data for that population where it's approved is right here, where you see a substantial delay in progression. The data for overall survival is not yet mature yet, so I, I can't really comment on it. But again, just like in Propel, the patients with BRCA2 mutations are largely the ones getting a humongous benefit. So if, if you have a patient with BRCA2, you've got now two choices, both of which um, should be strongly considered above and beyond using a potent AR inhibitor. Uh, this is the overall survival. There's a strong suggestion that it will be positive with more time and stay tuned for next year for this. Um, again, the downside of using PARP inhibitors is anemia. Talazoparib has a bit more anemia, 43% instead of 16% required blood transfusions. That's a big, much bigger number. Um, so there are risks with using PARP inhibitors. These are, it's like chemo pills, basically. It can cause drops in your blood counts and patients have to be followed very carefully and you need really an expert oncologist to follow you carefully and dose reduce and dose hold when that's needed to give blood if that's needed and to continue you know, uh, with perhaps a dose reduction so that you can still see those benefits. This is the, the new FDA label in June. Um, so I'm gonna skip through because I know um, we wanted to, uh, have you guys had talks about uh, Pluvicto, PSMA lutetium? Yes, um, Dr. Sartor covered. Uh, okay, that. great. So you, you guys should be very familiar with the vision study. So I'm going to skip over this. And Dr. Sartor and I are, are working on, you know, additional analyses on the vision study and Pluvicto using these fancy PET scans in 3D to, to look at who benefits the most from uh radioligand therapy targeting PSMA. And uh, this is a paper we just submitted a week ago um, based on a public a presentation we had last year that shows that patients with the brightest tumors have the best uh, survival. Um, patients that have their PSAs go down the best also have the best survival. So there are ways when you get drugs like Pluvicto to know if it's working, usually the PSA in the first 12 to 24 weeks will capture a lot of that benefit. Making decisions for the subsequent therapy, should you get Pluvicto, should you get more chemo, cabazitaxel, in patients uh, with very bright PET scans, SUVs of 10 or higher, it's very clear that Pluvicto tends to be better. You know, it's a basically makes sense if the target's there, it makes sense to target it, but if the target's not there, it's a more dim tumor, Cabazitaxel, it's a it's a pretty much a tie. So it's a good option for some patients. Cabazitaxel has been around for 10 plus years, still a very good weapon. You should not abandon it. Um, we're still learning about how it works, but it, it does work. You can see that using another AR inhibitor generally doesn't work. That should not be a, a, a common standard of care. Most patients tend to progress at their first scans when they do that from one AR inhibitor to another. 
but chemotherapy with cabazitaxel here delayed progression significantly. Sometimes we'll tack on a second chemo drug if I have a patient with liver metastases or neuroendocrine features, or if they have loss of two of these three tumor suppressors in their tumor DNA sequence. Um, there is a survival benefit from the addition of a platinum, which is kind of like a PARP inhibitor. It causes more DNA damage. Very uh, Tumors of the prostate are, can still be platinum sensitive, but typically only if they have what are called these aggressive variant uh, phenotype uh, features or genotypes. Uh, we have a dedicated research program at our institution and many others on neuroendocrine prostate cancer. Have you guys had much in the way of lectures on neuroendocrine prostate cancer, Brad? One of our patients, Amit Gatani, has neuroendocrine, and so he's yes. been asking everybody. He's emailed about... me many times. <laughs> yes, so he's he's kept us uh, yeah. thinking about that and treatment options for it. Right. So this is an area that needs a lot of help and advocacy, you know, from you guys, from the whole field funding for new drugs. You can see that, you know, the standard of care has been platinum based chemotherapy, but the response rate, while it's, it seems pretty high, it doesn't last very long. And patients tend to blow through chemotherapy within a year. Um, there have been many attempts to try other therapies. Uh, we published on immunotherapy, again, by itself, immunotherapy, like with a PD-1 blocker, is not very effective. We only had one patient uh, who had a, a complete response, but most patients tend not to respond. Um, I'm, I'm going to finish up with, uh, let, me, let me just jump. I know we wanted to get to uh, some questions, but I will finish up with, here. here's some of the research we're doing at our institution. Um we are part of several consortia at Duke. We have the Alliance Cooperative Group, which is a national cooperative group. We're part of the Department of Defense Prostate Cancer Consortium, which are all the studies that are marked with a star. We try to organize our studies so that we have something for everybody, um, whether it's localized prostate cancer, PSA recurrence, metastatic hormone sensitive. We're kind of missing studies right here right now because it's a very crowded space with a lot of recently approved drugs. That's called non-metastatic CRPC. And then we have trials really first line, second line and beyond that are attacking, attacking different ways that prostate cancer adapts and develops resistance. So I put a, a, a few of these in context. You know, Some of these are focused on immunotherapies so AMG 509, this is a, a bispecific T-cell engager against a prostate cancer cell surface membrane called STEEP1. It's a protein that's commonly expressed in prostate cancer. It's AR regulated. If you attend ESMO next month or hear the press releases, uh, this data will be presented for the first time. Um, we're also looking at combinations. You know, one checkpoint inhibitor does not help most patients with prostate cancer. So we're doing this trial called the CHAMP study. This is for patients with neuroendocrine prostate cancer or aggressive variant prostate cancer where we're giving both chemotherapy and two checkpoint inhibitors. So that's why we call it the CHAMP study. You know, it's, a, it's really a kitchen sink approach, which these patients really kind of need because one therapy generally doesn't work very well. Uh, we've published in uh, Science Translational Medicine a couple years ago that one of the ways to get neuroendocrine prostate cancer is that cells hijack chemokine receptors, CXCR2, and that promotes that lineage plasticity. And there are fortunately drugs that block that. And um, we're about to start next month a trial where we use a small molecule inhibitor of CXCR2, which is a chemokine receptor. And that also uh, works to augment immunity, but also block cell signaling within the cancer. And we do that in combination with enzalutamide to see if we can delay or prevent the emergence of that resistance. Um, we also have a number of other really interesting trials, um, a new AR degrader that's being done in conjunction with uh, cell gene and BMS. You'll, you'll have to wait to see the adult data uh, in January of 2024 for that one. Um, uh, there's also some co-activators that work with the AR to turn the AR androgen receptor on, and we have drugs that can block that, and we're testing those in phase one. Uh, another, a, a number of other novel agents that are both either immunogenic or DNA damaging. Um, a lot of is happening on these PSMA therapies. Uh, you've heard about the vision study from Dr. Sartor, but 
Uh, next month, the PSMA-4 study, which is pre-chemotherapy, will be presented in a year or two. The PSMA addition study, which is even before hormone resistance takes hold, the value of Pluvicto. Uh, we're, we're studying new targets. We have a study coming soon, a multi-center study that's targeting something other than PSMA with radioligia. It's called Bombasin. Um, and we have some neuro, neuroendocrine prostate cancer specific studies testing that. So I think that's probably enough of me speaking. <laughs> let's uh, let's just stop right there. Okay. And, and see um, if the audience has questions. Yeah, as usual, if you could raise your hand and we'll we'll call on you when you have questions. Um, David Plunkett had one in the chat. Uh, Andy, I don't know if you saw that one. It was asking oh. about different different PARP inhibitors and what recommends one over another. David? Yeah, I can That's answer. a good restatement. Yep. So, um, David, that's a good question. They're not all interchangeable. Um, as I showed you, talazoparib it does have more anemia. It also, uh, there's also drug-drug interactions. For example, enzalutamide will induce the metabolism of certain PARP inhibitors. It does not with alaparib. So the alaparib abby combo is very safe. You can give both drugs at full dose. But if you were to just swap out Abby for Enza, then the Enza would induce the metabolism of Alaparib, making it much less effective. So that would not be recommended by anybody. It shouldn't be. Of course, some people can recommend things without any data or evidence. Um, Talazoparib has to be dose reduced when you give it with Enza because of drug interactions. So instead of the monotherapy dose of a milligram, you have to give it half a milligram. Otherwise, it would not be safe. Um, Neraparib is a different PARP inhibitor. It also got FDA approved a couple of weeks ago, but seems to be less effective and more toxic. So wouldn't be something I'd recommend to patients. Good Thank question. you. Neraparib was the one that I saw a uh, mention of this past weekend. So that's uh, that's good information. Thanks. Yeah. Andy, just a question I had is a theme that I saw recurring, and it was with the last, uh, many of the trials, and with the last one as well, it's drug combinations, uh, could be, and, and just therapy combinations. It could be radiation and something. It could be immunotherapy and something. It could be yep. chemo and something. Um, early in our journey as a community, we worked with uh, CureMatch, and they recommend drug combinations and a recurring problem there was they would see that a patient had certain biomarkers and therefore looked like they would respond to a combination. You, they, would, they could have three monotherapies, but the, the pregnant question always was, should they combine those and, and maybe worry about toxicity, reduce the, uh, the, the uh, dosages, and thereby maybe have a more sustained response? But then there was always the challenge. There, was, there were no clinical randomized clinical trials that have been done on those specific combinations. So there was yes. no evidence. You're now off label and doctors don't want to prescribe it. Is there a trend to uh, exploring more combinations? Cause it certainly seems yeah, like. Thank, it. thank you for that, Brad. You know, the, the standard of care until the last couple of years has been sequential single agent therapy. And when you do that, you see very incremental improvements in survival, but doesn't work as well as hitting the cancer hard up front with combos. And so in men who start their journey with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer, uh, it's no longer standard of care to give single therapies. You know, So the AR inhibitors, like I showed you, even docetaxel may extend life. We're looking at quadruplet therapy now with PSMA lutetium in that setting or PARP inhibitors have moved now even earlier uh, to as part of research studies. So those, those trials are ongoing looking at you know, new triplet combinations. And it, you know, the idea is that cancer is a, um, think of it as like a species in your body. It's got lots of different subpopulations and heterogeneity, you know, much like tuberculosis or lymphoma, where you, you know, multi-drug regimens have actually cured people. Um, you know, when we had HIV infection, you know, using AZT alone did not do much, but once you had highly active antiretroviral therapy with four drugs, you had patients like Magic Johnson living 20 plus years uh, with excellent disease control. 
So the idea is is to hit many you know non redundant mechanisms in the cancer that uh, but do it safely. You know, if just because somebody in the lab found that you know a pathway is active doesn't mean you can just safely throw that at the patient. Um, there's a lot of normal tissue cells in your body that have these targets also, and that's why it's very important to pay attention to you know safety and how you dose it, if there's drug interactions, what the normal organ toxicity and tolerability for patients is. Um, so it is important to study combinations and most of the field is moving towards these sorts of combinations, particularly immune therapies, I think where you're seeing huge successes like in non-small cell lung cancer, small cell lung cancer, kidney and bladder, which I also treat huge combination successes. Um, immunotherapy is one of those things that has mostly failed men with prostate cancer. So that, that is a, a reason that we're focused a lot on, um, developing ways to draw those T cells into the tumor, to have the cancer be recognized by your immune system, to overcome those shields, the checkpoints, whether they're myeloid checkpoints or T cell checkpoints, uh, those combinations, in my opinion, will be the most successful going forward. Um, but yeah, I mean, assays that predict combinations are not yet valid in the clinic. Um, that might work in a mouse model or a cell line, but you know, human are not humans are not mice, and humans are not cell lines. And you have organs, and you have um, important drug interactions to consider. And so, if if you have that finding, that should be validated in clinical trials. You know, through phase one, careful dose finding and drug development. But those those cocktails. You know, if, if they're found to be common, uh, that should spur more research, not just using those things off label. Thank you. Any questions from others? Okay. Um, Alan, this is your cue. Uh, Alan Morris had uh, a couple of uh, what he called impertinent questions. Happy to take any impertinent questions. Um, actually, this is a pertinent question. Um, uh, it turns out that because there's all these new advances in the last five years in, in combination with, uh, admittedly, your studying combinations, the permutations of how a patient gets into the metastatic castrate resistant state uh, is incredibly variable. My question to you, and it, it, it's something that's um, important to uh, uh, patients, is how do they even determine their prognosis? In the earlier stage, like localized disease, there's MSK mm -hmm. nomograms where you can, uh, oh, geez, post-prostatectomy, this is my likelihood of being not BCR. In other words, you know, I have a 70%, you know, all comers, it's a 70% chance because let's say I'm making up 30 to 50% of people uh, or 30 to 40% of people BCR. There's actually nomograms where if yep. you are- you know, Yeah, we yeah. use those all the time. Yeah, my question to you is, are, the, are they developing nomograms for all the crazy permutations that happen for yeah. a patient uh, in, in this uh, MC? So yeah, I, I've yeah. published at least five nomograms over my career. Um, yeah. By the, you know, and all of these are in hormone resistant patient populations based on thousands of patients. So if, if you just look up my, you know, publications in PubMed, you'll find them. But by the time you, you publish these nomograms, often the field has moved on. Yeah. For example, just, just uh, this year, we, we validated a, a nomogram that was developed by a colleague of mine here at Duke, Susan Hallaby. She's probably got the most famous nomogram. We call it the Hallaby model. And um, she validated that in 8,000 patients. So it's a, an amazingly validated model for men with castrate-resistant prostate cancer who are getting treated with an AR inhibitor or chemotherapy. And that was published in JCO 2023. Um, however, that model, even though it was just published this year, the field has now, as I've just shown you in all these slides, we're now using these AR inhibitors earlier in the hormone-sensitive setting. So now we need models um, that are valid in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting when a patient is treated with appropriate intensification. And so, for example, as the principal investigator of the ARCHES study, that's a project we're working on right now is to develop and validate a model along with, you know, other docs like Chris Sweeney, who's the PI Benzamed or 
Kim Chi or others for Titan combining data sets that allow a lot of power and sample size. We we kind of know already that prognosis is related to disease volume, whether a patient started with stage four disease or relapse determines prognosis, the amount of prostate cancer you have. And, and I could just show you, you know, again, at, at the beginning of my talk, I showed you some survival curves in the hormone sensitive setting where survival, you know, really widely um, defers based on the number of metastases that you have. Um, and right here. So uh, this is overall survival. All men got conventional intensified therapy with ADT and enzalutamide. And um, the men in this orange group had a large number of metastases and the men in this blue group had a small number of metastases. So you can see that, you know, uh, with treatment intensification, they live longer. You know, the, the um, blue curves are ENZA. So you, you live longer with ENZA. The orange curves are ADT alone. And then they're color coded by how many metastases you have, less than five or more than five. And so um, disease volume matters. That's just one variable, but there's other features like pain and hemoglobin and uh, functional status, alkaline phosphatase. Your genomics matter. Uh, we have an NIH grant right now where we're putting together what's called a clinical genetic model where we fuse all the clinical features and there's about 10 that are important. And we fuse those with the tumor genetics, P53, RB, AR, BRCA2. And we make a model that combines that and, and thousands of patients that can then predict the future. So that, that's, you know, it's always an, an area of active development, an area that I work on very closely with statisticians and molecular biologists to always make the models as um, pertinent and um, contemporary as possible. But the data sets have to be mature, you know, the, the, uh, in order to be a good prognosticator, you know, you need years of follow-up. And a lot of these trials just got FDA approved in the past two or three years. So patients are still alive, fortunately, and in and, and follow-up and it's, you really need more mature data to develop uh, something that you can actually speak to a patient about in terms of their prognosis. Just for the lay people here, Nomogram is a term you used, which I must confess I don't know. It's a it's a mathematical model, um, so you can put it in an app. You know, we actually have uh, little app models in prostate cancer, uh, an online tool. Basically, for statistically, it's just a multivariable model, and these variables are your clinical um, terms, like where is your cancer spread? Are you having pain? Are you anemic? What's your functional status like? You put those little things into your variable and the nomogram or model spits out what's your five-year survival. Uh -huh. They're not always correct. <laughs> so they give you the most accurate up-to-date information that we have, um, but there's some error to it. So we always you know, phrase this very gently when you're talking to patients that this is what the model says. Obviously our treatments have gotten a lot better. It, your survival could be a lot better. Uh, your survival could be updated and even better if you respond um, to the next therapy that we're giving you. So these are just estimates. They're they're intended to be more doctor-patient communication tools. So if you knew that you had a six-month survival, you might do things differently than if you had an expectation of living five years or more. Okay, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Maybe, Andy, you can look at them. Uh, one's from Chad Magnuson about Bombesin radiotherapy? Ah, yeah, so I, I just touched on that briefly. Bombesin, it's a great name, uh, is a cell surface receptor that is on neuroendocrine prostate cancer. So neuroendocrine prostate cancer is a very different beast than typical prostate cancer. It lacks PSMA. So you, in most, you know, two thirds of cases, there's no PSMA. So you can't use Pluvicto. You can't use PSMA targeting at all because it's not there. But neuroendocrine cells, they upregulate other cell surface receptors and uh, maybe a talk for a different day. But DLL3 and CCAM and CXCR2 and bombesin are just four examples 
of a uh, of cell surface receptors that you could leverage to both image neuroendocrine prostate cancer with positrons or target neuroendocrine prostate cancer with radioligands. And uh, so the trial that we're about to open targets bombesin. And we will see if that works. I mean, it's first time it's ever been done. Thank you. Another question here from John Lancaster. John, I don't know if you want to ask it or or Andy, you can just see the question in the chat. It's about- Oh yeah, yeah. Darolutamide is a great drug. Um, it did show up in my slides when I was talking about triplet therapy. Here, I'll show, see if I can, uh, you know, darolutamide's right here as a recommended triplet therapy because we have this trial called the- uh, the ARASENS trial, where darolutamide, when studied in combination with both ADT and docetaxel, delayed progression and improved survival. So darolutamide is another AR inhibitor that is active. It has not been studied as a doublet therapy. So it's only right now got data in conjunction with docetaxel. So that's why it doesn't show up as an option in any of these other boxes. Um, Enza, Abby, and APA have the data to support doublet therapy. Darolutamide doesn't yet have it. I'm not saying it won't. It probably will. If you just uh, wait for the Aaron Note trial, which is an ongoing study being done globally, um, I, I would expect darolutamide to have very similar data. So I think of it as an equally active agent. Largely, these AR inhibitors are very similar to each other. They do have differences in side effects but their efficacy potency is very similar. Um, darolutamide has some advantages of not going into your brain, not causing cognitive problems, which can affect some men uh, with the other AR inhibitors like enzalutamide about 3% of the time. Um, darolutamide has less fatigue and fractures, less of a fall risk. So it is it's a good therapy. It's approved in non-metastatic CRPC. It's approved in hormone sensitive metastatic disease and it will continue to, you know, it's in many, many trials right now. So you'll see data kind of roll out over the coming years where it will become uh, probably a, a very much more popular therapy. And so it is a good choice. I'm glad you asked about it. I, I prescribe it all the time. I'm, I'm interested because I've just started on darolutamide. Okay. Uh, on top of the past oh, six and a half years of Lupron. Yeah. Um, which uh, for which I received a, a, a course of docetaxel right at the beginning of the of the luprolide um, treatment. Um, at my oncologist at Dana Farber said that uh, that combination, in other words, docetaxel briefly at the beginning of the uh, uh, lupron therapy uh, would have could have significant uh, benefits. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And so if you I have had a nasty, prostate, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had a nasty reaction, reaction to the docetaxel, so yeah. they stopped fairly quickly. <laughs> I see. But it, yeah, it did Darolutamide is very well tolerated. I mean, not everybody tolerates it, but it, of the AR inhibitors, it's probably the best tolerated. So that may be one of the reasons they picked it. So far, so good. <laughs> oh, that's great to hear. Okay. We've got about five minutes left. Um, I, I, I might want to, um, you know, if there's no more questions, I, I skipped over one little section that I think is important, and it's the disparity issue. I, I don't know in your group if you have um, how the, what the diversity of the group is like, but um, I, I, you know, if you look at <clears throat> nationally, Black men are, are, are dying at about two and a half fold rate as white men. Um, and so I just wanted to show one little slide here of, of data we're doing here to overcome that disparity. So in, um, you know, right now we know that black men are dying at a higher rate, but when black men are included in clinical trials, they're often doing equal or not, if not better than white men, which is pretty cool to think about. So, um, when we've published this in with Sapulis LT and immunotherapy that black men, when matched to white men have a better outcome with immunotherapy. And we've published with abiraterone that there's better PSA outcomes in, in men of African ancestry. Uh, Susan Hallaby has published with docetaxel as black men tend to do a little bit better, but yet they still 
are majorly underrepresented in our clinical trials. The percent of our trials that are black men, somewhere around 3%, it's awful. Um, this is a negative study. You'll probably never read about it because it did not get FDA approved. This is this trial called ACES, where two AR inhibitors were given as compared to one AR inhibitor. So ABI, standard of care, or APA plus ABI. And this trial you know, did delay progression, but did not improve survival. And that's probably why you haven't heard about this study. This was largely uh, a white study. This patient population was global and 96% were not of African ancestry. And so we did a study at Duke and we presented this data just at ASCO. I thought you guys might be interested in this where we gave this regimen, APA and ABI, but now we were intentionally inclusive of race. Uh, we had a European or a Caucasian American group, 50-50 now with African-Americans. And what we were amazed to see is at the end of this study, we uh, black men did amazingly well with this double AR combo. Not only did they have better outcomes with delaying progression, but better survival. You know, the chance of making it two years was 86% in black men and 67% for white men. So this suggests that, you know, while we're typically taught that race is a cultural non-biologic construct, which is true, ancestry um, can have biological effects um, and African ancestry may have an association with sensitivity to AR blockade and perhaps two AR inhibitors in men of African ancestry might uh, be advantageous. And so we're looking at this data and thinking of, you know, maybe we should advance this further in, a, in an appropriately inclusive uh, trial. So that was just a plug for um, being more inclusive in our trials. And you can certainly advocate that for as a patient organization. Yeah, to be honest, it's one of our weaknesses is we've we've made efforts to include more African American men in our community, but we're, they're very underrepresented yes. at present. There's a great group called FEN, P H E N, that I'm I'm sure would love to work with you. Thank you. If if you could make a connection, we would appreciate it. Sure, happy to. Thank you. Um, we're about at the hour. Any other last minute questions or comments? This all just reinforces my opinion that it pays off to hit it hard and hit it early. Exactly. Yeah. Or cure it right up front. <laughs> if that's possible. If cure is not possible, then there's so many mutations in the cancer. It's it's not surprising that a multi-drug regimen is the way to go. Andy, are you acquainted with Bob Gattenby at Moffitt? Yeah. He, he's okay. a proponent of the adaptive intermittent approach. Correct. And also, I think uh, viewing it from an evolutionary biology perspective, yes. and therefore the hitting it hard and early is also, mm -hmm. because it's a heterogeneous population, yep. I think he would also be an advocate of that that strategy as well. And for us, it was quite um, enlightening to hear his strategic approach, which seemed as we've discussed today, more combinations, mm -hmm. uh, more adaptive, more personalized, all these things yeah. that we don't hear. It's more like monotherapies, try it until it fails, go on to your next monotherapy, try it until it fails, which seems to be the... Yeah, I, I think the, the difference between you know what Bob is doing and uh, is he's got a small number of patients where he's done this in, there's not really a control group and it hasn't taken off in the real world because it doesn't have that medical evidence you need. And so it's not to say that it's not true, but it just hasn't been developed further so that we can recommend that to patients. That's what has to happen. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Andy. I'm going to stop recording and um, if I can find it. Thanks for the invitation <laughs> again. Do, do you have uh, time for a prognosis question, Dr. Armand?